most especially to inspire others to continue their passion and love in the lapidary hobby. Okay? And again, this is the place where we share our knowledge, ask our questions, and get tips and tricks all about the lapidary art. And for tonight's call, we are honored to have Jason Russell as our guest speaker along with Jan Sherman. He is a geologist and a lapidary enthusiast. So tonight is all about core drill essentials. And for your Q&A, you can raise your hand if you have any questions by going into our reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom and click raise hand, or you can also post your questions in the chat. So we encourage everybody to participate and make it as interactive as possible. So I know you are all excited. This is gonna be a never been done before session on core drilling. So let's kick off tonight's webinar with our intro video. Hey there, so let's get John and uh, Jason and I pinned up here. I can pin me and I can pin John, add pin and I can add Jason. So while you're doing that, Sherman, I wanna ask everyone, how many people are cutting spheres? If you are a spear cutter, just put yes in the chat. Oh, there's Lori. Not yet, Gary. We'll get you started. Yeah, a bunch of people here. All right. Trying. We'll help you get past that. James yeah, yeah. Carpenter, when we have time. Great to see you here, James. Yeah, the core drill is the magical formula for cutting spheres. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know it, but I was, uh, let's see, I started cutting spheres in, uh, it was about 1990. And um, I got into it because I was into marbles and I was into collecting those old uh, German agate marbles. And I started cutting balls uh, with, a, I designed my first machine and I started cutting balls out of little Lakers. And I did that for years. And then I just started getting bigger and bigger and finding bigger rough and falling in love with making spheres. And uh, everybody's always aware of, you know, cutting the preform by taking your material and cutting a block out of it and then basically you know your block is what six cuts 
And then when you cut all the corners off and all the edges off, by the time you're done, you're 26 cuts in. And I was doing that. I had an army of saws and, um, and was going through blades and oil like crazy. And then the grind time, because we were all using silicon carbide back then, you cut a Brazilian agate preform, three inch, you can grind, rough grind on that for two days to get it round. Um, and I got kind of tired of that. So back in uh, the mid 90s, uh, I started looking at how to develop faster ways of cutting spears. And uh, I started developing the core machine then, but the real problem I had once I got the core machine together was that uh, core bits that are available wouldn't cut hard materials. I'd sit there and squeal and you'd be, you know, you're, back then uh, uh, if, I, if I bought like an eight inch bit, uh, that bit could cost you 350 bucks and then I couldn't even get it through a piece of jade and jade is like cutting butter if you have a good diamond tool. So we developed our own diamond segments then and um, and then that was right around the time that the high speed sphere machine came into existence and and it all came together right around 99, 2000 and then we ran our shop with uh, two high-speed sphere machines and a core drill. And uh, I built a big hydraulic machine back then too. So what you see in our equipment today is from decades of trial and error and evolution and R&D. And, and so what Jason's gonna show you all today, you'll see all of those uh, developments and tools at work and how it, completely transformed the whole experience of making spheres. Where before you could get a sphere in a week, now you can produce a sphere in an hour. So it's how many people are interested change. in in core drilling? Put yes in the chat if you are interested in core drilling. You can produce one in an hour, but you're much better off batching them because that's a lot of changing out. Yes, batching is key. Right. Lots of potential core drillers here. Yeah. Well, you what know, I John, like to, what I'd like to, to notice when you're core drilling is when you take a rock, and this was the problem with cutting cubes, is when you start cutting a cube, that first six cuts, you got a lot of time invested in the first six, six cuts. And by the time you get to cut number four or five, if you discover a defect, you're kind of like, well, I'm gonna finish it up and hopefully it will turn out all right. But if you're core drilling, you get six cuts in the first drill and you look at the core and you go, yeah, this one's not that great. You just toss it because you got nothing invested in it compared to what you would have invested in cutting the cube. So the quality of what you produce gets better because you're not tying up all your time. So um, where do we want to start, Sherman? Well, I think what we want to start is the first video, which is kind of the introduction about the core drill. Jason walks through it. Uh, I want to just touch the base a little bit. And, and, and by the way, guys, for some of you, you saw that our, our, our YouTube was down um, for a couple of days because we got hijacked by some Bitcoin assholes and we got it back so now we're going to punish them um but um which is stupid because they actually showed us what their youtube site is um but we we're trying to get the live going on youtube it's not live so some people that may be on youtube they need to come over to facebook because we actually don't have youtube streaming yet because something's not set up I wanted to touch on one point. I remember going to your shop and you had all those 35 little machines cranking and you get out about 35 balls a week. Wasn't that yeah. right? With the old carbide machines. And, and I had, I think I had 10 saws, 35, 35 spare machines. And I could, I could produce 35 balls a week. And you had a full-time employee that was also yeah. feeding those and machines. And then when we, well, we put our, our, our sphere shop, we moved it over into our factory in China for a while. And I had 
four high-speed machines, one core drill, and two big hydraulic machines. And we could produce more than 35 in a day on way yeah. less equipment, way less demand. Oh, and, and we got away from the silicon carbide grit. I used to produce 300 pounds of waste silicon carbide a month. And boy, in California, that was a pain in the ass to try and get rid of. Yep. Yep. Well, I know in China, we were actually running, you were averaging a lot of times about 125 balls per machine on the high speed machines. The bigger machines were lower capacity, but you're selling, making a ball that is going to sell for a substantial amount of money. Yeah. Um, and then that all well, moved the output out to the difference. The output difference between the two technologies is huge. I mean, right. if you really want to get frustrated with spear cutting, then then cut cubes and, and grind them with silicon carbide. I mean, it's, it's, it's so slow. It's not that satisfying. And it's expensive because you're paying electricity the whole time. Because I remember that was the big thing is you had a huge electricity bill there in California running all those motors, all the yeah. heat. Like you come into the shop and it's freaking hot from the motors of all these machines cranking. Yeah. And so. well, and the other thing is, is that, and, and you know, when I, when I went to Diamond Tools, uh, the, the main thought was, I'm really sick of the grit because the grit gets everywhere. It gets in your house. It just, it's all over your shop. And I thought, I don't care if it costs more. I'm sick of the grit. And then I went through all the work and, um, and certainly I thought it was going to cost me more. Well, the net net is that my cost per sphere dropped when I got away from the grit because literally the grit process is so inefficient that you're just dumping this grit on a ball and then the grit flow is hard to control. You get any moisture in your grit, then it gets clogged up and the diamond cups are super efficient and super fast. And when you throw them in a high speed machine, now your grind time on rough grind, you know, if you core drill and, and, um, and, and uh, use a high speed sphere machine for rough grind, the rough grind went from with grit two days to with diamond ten minutes. Yeah, God, or or like, it was mind or blowing. Less. When I when the first time I did it, it was I was literally my mind was blown. I couldn't believe it. But I'm not leaving all this material on the ball. So let's roll right. the first video. Yep. It's the Highland Park core drill, the CD four. It's a very nice unit. Hats off to the guys at Holland Park. Premise is core bit, same as drill rig. Goes onto a spinning shaft. It's lowered up and down the mast. Oil over water um, configuration up here for uh, pressure release and drive. And yeah, let's get it started. We'll run through the operation. So toggle switch, up and down. You got a depth meter here. I've got it set to millimeters, I'm Aussie. What can I say? You can change it to whatever you want. Uh, the main purpose for this is setting zero, lower it down, touch the plate, set zero. That way you know where you are in the rock at any time. Uh, once you start penetrating, it's hard to judge exactly where you are without that, so it's essential. Uh, we have a rapid feed, tap valve. Uh, that's simply for lowering it down to get close to the rock. And then the micro feed, it's a needle valve. The needle valve just goes a lot slower. This is the main function. The further you wind it, the faster it penetrates. And that's about that. Uh, over here, is our master switch. Turn on our master switch. Safety gear on. Start up our pump. Our pump is circulating oil from the base up through the uh, drill bit itself. We also have an auxiliary secondary oil that sprays on the outside of where you're cutting. Uh, that goes back down through a hole and recirculates. It also has an Everclear, Everclean, sorry, on the side. Um, that's essential. Uh, the amount of grit that this generates is astronomical compared to a saw. It's got to be at least 
four to five times the amount. So we already lowered it down. We're on top of the uh, rock that we want to drill. So oil's on. Start the drill. Start off lowering it as a little faster than normal, just until we start getting down, hitting that little ting ting ting. And then as soon as you hit that ting ting ting, we want to back it off until the teeth bite. Once the teeth bite, it's just pure sound. You listen to the penetration rate, you back it off or speed it up depending on what's going on. I also like to use a dowel. The nice thing with the dowel is it not only stabilizes the rock at the initial start when its teeth are starting to bite, but it also helps understand the vibration. You don't want to put your hands down in there, and so this allows you to feel what's going on with the rock, transfers the vibration through, and worst case scenario, I buy a new dowel. And there we have it. Let's get some rock drilled. All right. Good, good introduction, dude. I mean, it's like cranking it up. So there, some of you guys may be wondering up top, there's a, there's a variable frequency drive that makes this variable speed. So that, that shaft that you can see to the left of the cylinder of Jason, that is a hex drive shaft. If anybody grew up on a farm and you remember like a bush hog, which expands. So that actually shaft expands in a coupling. And then you've got a feed mechanism. Um, well, basically you've got a pulley that goes across to the main shaft. There's a rotating union underneath that red cover and uh, coolant's injected down there. You'll see Jason do that in that next video, but uh, it's oil over air. Jason was laughing. He's like, yeah, I called it water, no, uh, water over oil. It's, it's air over oil. Air over oil. Yes. Now, which really is smooth. Look, let me explain why we do that. One, I didn't want to put a hydraulic pump on this because it's more moving parts. Hydraulic mm -hmm. pumps are notoriously sensitive to dirt. So by using air over oil, you can use a little air compressor. You hook it up to the main valve on this and the air pressure, those two reservoirs on the, uh, the, the stainless steel reservoirs on the top left, those are oil reservoirs. They have hydraulic oil in them. It doesn't require much pressure to move the head on this. So that toggle valve that, that Jason pointed out, that changes the pressure on each line that pushes on that particular reservoir. And then that reservoir forces the oil into one or the other port of the cylinder, which will make it go up or down. Now, why the oil is important is that if you had just air pressure, if you tried to run it on air pressure, you would get movement that would go from static friction to kinetic. So it, uh, uh, like that. And that's kind of a problem if you're kind of coming down, approaching the rock and it does that because it's going to hit the rock, it's going to crash, you're going to knock teeth off the bit and you're going to not be happy. So the oil, what it does is it creates a very, very cushioned uh, effect because we're pushing the oil through a metering valve and that orifice controls the flow really well so you get this very very smooth steady motion but you don't have to have a hydraulic pump so the system's simpler we and use the, the same system... concept on our 36d drop saw right um so richard system... asked a question here what holds the rock now when i first started doing this I designed the most convoluted vice for the thing and I was trying to hold the stuff and you grab a rock from the outside and you're squeezing it and then the core bit goes through it and the rock collapses and then everything locks up and makes a whole bunch of debris and and I'm like I was really trying to reason through how to hold the rock and one of the things that I realized is that when I made my core bit segments, I made them really free cutting. And I had a- Explain I had a, free cutting just for people who don't uh, have an idea. Free cutting part. means that, that the, the pressure of the core bit on the rock is very, very low because the diamond tool is cutting the rock really effectively. 
So if you've got a free cutting blade, it means your blade pressure is low and you're not pushing on the rock really hard, which is great if you're drilling a piece of opal. You don't want, uh, you don't want a, a, a bit that is you know, not free cutting uh, because you'll, you'll break your stone. Um, so basically what I discovered is that if I just have a piece that's sitting stable, like if I cut a uh, rock and I take one cut on it and I set it down on the base of that core drill, I don't need to hold it at all. I come down with the core a bit. And what I do is I have these two long screwdrivers and I, all I do is I stabilize the rock when I first get engagement. And when I get the full engagement of the bit, then I can just let go. The rock's You're going to see gonna... Jason do that in this yeah. next video. The rock's not going to spin. Uh, you don't have to have some kind of crazy vice. And, and so then our method became, we're going to cast everything in casting plaster. So I would just lay them out. I'd lay newspapers on the cement floor, get the nice flat part of my cement floor, lay newspapers out, mix up plaster parish, throw a big blob down and stick the rock in it. And I can use little pieces of stone to get the face that I want to be drilling to sit up. And that's all that's required. And pl casting plaster is dirt cheap. And it's cheaper than cutting a flat face, and I can get the maximum size ball out of every piece. Recording. That was interesting. I think Jason is coming on, and I'm just going to try to find him here because uh, I think he switched cameras. Oop. Uh, let's see. I'm going to add me as a pen and let's see if I can find Jason. Why don't you run the next video while you're finding Jason? Yeah, go ahead and find uh, Run that next video. This, that perfect. Got this nice piece of Mexican fluorite. I'm going to try and cut a few cylinders out of this, uh, cross cut them, get the preforms ready for spheres. I like the uh, core drill for spheres simply because you don't have to do the 26 cuts. I did the 26 cuts once, got halfway through my second one and decided I don't have the time. It's, uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of hours. Um, this way, three to four cores and away you go. So let's, uh, this one's pretty obvious which way we're gonna lie it. It's gonna sit like that or it's going to sit like that. Um, <laughs> coring it like this just isn't going to be very stable at all and won't make much sense. So let's sit it like this. It's reasonably stable. We might get the angle grinder out. Uh, use the Highland Park uh, wet grinder with the uh, diamond wheel on it. We might just take a couple of these off. Uh, the other way to do it is to plaster a Paris it. Uh, I have tried wedges in the past. This bit's probably suitable for a wedge, but I'd rather do plaster Paris or just, I like to keep them cut with a flat face. Here's an example of some rose quartz that had a really irregular face. So I just cut a square face on it. That one's reasonably flat. It'll sit really nicely in the drill. So once we've determined how it's gonna sit flat in the drill, the next thing to do is work out what size sphere we're gonna make. So I've got two core bits over here. Uh, this one is the Two and a half inch, it's easily going to fit. And we have our three inch. Um, obviously it could fit, however, I want to stay away from this edge. And I want to stay away from this edge. We've got a lot of divots in here. Um, we don't want the core to show any of these. Uh, I did one earlier in earlier video and I just missed it. So hopefully I can get this just at an enough angle to be able to avoid that uh, 
little void there. So for this one, two and a half inches is going to be it. So in terms of the ball's presentation, we're going to want to get as much of this purple as possible. This rock is really beautiful with the uh, purple and the green, both in one. Um, if we just get the green, it'll still look okay, but it won't be as striking. So let's sit this back down. And the next thing to see is maximize our rock. So I like to mark it out just to get a bit of a feel um, without getting too close to the edges. Uh, Now we've got this all marked up, got an idea of how we want it to sit. Uh, the next step will be, I'm just gonna get the grinder, grinding wheel, and uh, just take a few of these off, just so that it sits a bit flatter. Really, it's hinging on this area and this area here. So if we can just drop those down, just a fraction, then uh, we'll be good to go. Put it in the drill and start drilling. Now you'll notice that Jason is the guy who said he did 26 cuts and then he did the next 26. He's like, man, this sucks. I, I want to go faster. So in, in the next, so notice that when Jason's queuing this up, he's not even wanting to use plaster of Paris. He's like, let me make it flat, stick it in the drill and drill it. Right. Um, because you, you generally, for a lot of your drilling, I assume the stuff you're working with tends to be more flat. So you can then put them in, on the bottom and drill them. Yeah, I usually try and choose my material with a flat side. Interestingly, yeah. that rose quartz I showed you, I did end up using plaster of Paris on that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there was a little void on the side that just made it unstable enough to where if I had it got partway through and it started to rock, it could have easily twisted off and broken or bent something. So right. I did use plaster of Paris on that. Right. Right, right. Well, and for when John's been doing this setup, I mean, we've done lots of spheres. We have like in China, we had like tile floors and we just had it covered with uh, with um, spheres. Right. But John would position and say, OK, I want to do a cut here. So they'll hold it. The guys would then be stacked and he's figuring out how he's going to perp. You really get maximum use out of those those rough. And then we turn the rest into cabochons or other types of things with all the drops from the quarry. It's very efficient. Um, anything that you wanted so, to cover on this before we uh, go to I'll the... answer Laurie's uh, question. The hydraulic fluid is basically just a standard hydraulic oil that's used in any kind of hydraulic reservoir. Uh, it's not going to be picky about that. So the tractor supply is probably be fine for getting something like that. There's actually a couple other questions. Richard had a question. What holds the rock? Uh, we'll actually cover that with yeah. the drilling too, because you'll see the force on the next video. Um, uh, uh, Zeke, you're asking, does the drill come with an Everclean or you buy it separate? You do buy it separate. Um, some people already have an Everclean or freestanding Everclean. And so we'll, part of what we are aiming to do is to keep the price of that overall unit low. Um, and I think it's, I think the, the piece is, I think it's still underneath. I don't know what the price is. I think it's under 10K um, with 10K. free shipping. And uh, and one of the things we did do, you'll note that in Jay, uh, Jason's place, it's fairly tall. We actually changed the design because uh, uh, we've had customers whose their shops were Shop shorter was ceiling. Yeah. So we have the ability for you now to adjust the height. So it's actually, instead of shipped one unit, it's actually configurable. So you can actually configure the height of that. Um, 
And Azik, you were also asking how big of a preform can this machine make? What's the biggest bit that we ship uh, for the, the core machine? The, the CD4, uh, I haven't actually tried it. I know based on the horsepower that I put on it, you could probably cheat a six inch bit through a piece. You would, uh, you would, you know, want to slow the feed down. Like we, we sell it tooled to four. Uh, honestly, most people that are buying spheres buy between the two inch and four inch range. Um, if you want to do big stuff, we have the big drill. Um, but you know, it's a lot more of an investment. There's a lot more hardware in that. And, uh, and so, you know, like we've, we've sold a number of the big drills, but, uh, you got to be pretty serious or or a little bit rich. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The normal height of the drill, is that what you're asking, Zeke? Uh, the the drill originally, I designed it, the CD4, it, it came out really close to eight feet. And the problem is, is that we shipped it laying down um, because obviously if you have an eight foot drill and you have people running forklifts, it's really easy for somebody to drop it. So we made it so we ship it laying down. But the problem is, is when you go to stand it up, the process of standing it up, it won't, you can't stand it up inside of eight foot ceiling. So what I did with the current design of the CD4 is I took the subframe and basically did away from with the subframe and then I made a set of heavy duty legs so so now the unit ships vertical and you lift one side up you bolt the leg on then you lift the other side up you bolt the leg on and and it's it's still like you're gonna need you're gonna need some either uh, some uh, some mechanical assistance or a whole bunch of friends and and a, and a case of beer to stand the thing up in your shop but it's a lot it's a lot shorter now, um, and there's some adjustment on the feet, so it yeah. will fit in any in any normal garage. And the other thing that a lot of people don't understand that, like when I first did this thing, um, I had this complex. The first drill had this complex uh, variable pitch pulley drive on it, and uh, because I didn't have access to VFDs. I mean, you know, this is almost 20 years ago. The, the VFDs were crazy expensive then. Uh, VFDs are variable frequency drive. Now, the original VFDs would take a three phase in and a three phase out and you can change the speed. Now, the VFDs that we're getting now, single phase in. So you can just hook them up to 220 in your normal 220 that you have in your house. And, like for a it stove outlet, generates, and it generates the three phase output and that allows you to have variable speed running on single phase power, which is really awesome because now the whole drivetrain got a lot simpler. Now, the reason, Shermer talked about the hex drive before, the reason that we have that hex drive shaft is you don't want to hang your motor and everything on the head because then the head gets really heavy. And if the head gets too heavy, then controlling the speed of the drilling gets really difficult. Mm -hmm. So the hex drive it allows you to keep all your motor and all your heavy hardware sitting on the top of the machine. And the head of the, the moving carriage of the machine can be very light. Right. So right. that's kind of like this thinking and the reasons behind some of that stuff. Let's go to the drill. I want we pick up that first drill so you guys will see how this works. Is a Mexican fluoride again. So I ended up, instead of cutting this on the saw, we're using plaster power. Oop, do it again there. Or did we just lose her with power? Um, uh, I'm going to just fire it up on my end here. We might have just had a power outage there in uh, the Philippines, possibly. So bear with me. And HBI Live, core drilling, videos. Yeah, I change. think we got interrupted. I, I, yeah, yeah, I it happens. Um, all right, here we go. We're going to, I'm going to queue it up on my side here. Okay. Oh, I got the wrong video. Let me get the next video. Drilling. And bear with Mexican me just a again. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and make sure I share 
and optimize for video. You all see my screen there, John? Yep. All right, here we go. So I ended up, instead of cutting this on the saw or using Plaster Paris, I ended up using the diamond blade on the wet polisher. This thing's pretty aggressive, but it does a really nice job. Took that down a matter of uh, less than a minute. Uh, made it perfectly flat, enough to stabilize it. So before we do that, let's just double check that we're on zero. Um, we have a depth meter on this drill, which allows us to work out where we are with our depth. And we definitely don't want to be going below zero because then we start cutting into this board and that's at zero so let's pull that back up and we'll be about ready to go with the rock in place and the safety shields on safety equipment on let's uh, lower this core bit down we use the rapid feed to get down to the proximity and then the micro feed Helps us go down, I'll get a little closer. That looks good. Get the oil going. Looks good. Drill. This is such a big piece of rock, it's really stable, it shouldn't go anywhere, but I like to have it just in case. Use micro feed to lower that down. I'll lower it down a little faster than normal, just until I hear that. You can hear that right there. And then I back off. Squeeze this down until the teeth are in the rock all around. Once that's in, we can speed it up. There's no hard fast drill that how fast it actually penetrates. It's completely to do with the sound. If it starts to squeal, you can Turn it up, turn it down to the penetration rate. This is cut really nicely. It's probably actually speed up a little bit. Turn the micro feed off. I like to keep the oil pump on as it's coming up. Just keep the rock down in place. through on the other side it's actually really good that's really pretty all right so so jason uh, jason how long was that cut time on that uh that one less than 15 minutes so i probably took it a little slower than i should have that flu right yeah that's so quick that's a, little, <laughs> that's a little on the slow side i was gonna guess that should be 
uh, that should be about a three or four minute cut if you're letting the machine do it do its thing. Um, the feed rate I usually look for is about a millimeter every 15 seconds if if I'm running about a three inch bit. Like obviously on our big drills, if we're running like an eight or a 10, you're not gonna see quite the same feed rate because you're removing a lot more material. And, and Florida is a pretty soft material. Yeah. You know, that you're well, gonna be able no, to push it. That's great. It really demonstrates the, how the machine works. The other thing I wanted to mention to people uh, because it's kind of important and, and I, you could see Jason stop the machine a couple of times. There's two, there's two buttons on the front of the control. There's, a, there's like a switch to turn the drive on and turn the drive off. And that's what we call uh, a, a soft, soft start, soft stop. Uh, there's a red button on the front and that red button, what it does is it turns on a dynamic braking inside the unit. Now, when that is really important is if you're in the middle of a, of a piece and maybe you broke into a hollow cavity or maybe a chip came off and something's going wrong in the drill and you hit that red button, that dynamic braking stops that bit really fast. Um, the first drill I made had that big, heavy variable pitch pulley on it and it had so much spun weight that if you heard it starting to go pop 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 and you stop the drill by the time the drill completely stopped there was no teeth left on the bit because it, you know <laughs> it just it had so much weight spun weight that it was just going to tear everything up when i went to this drive i reduced all of the spun weight massively it's so much lighter so with the dynamic braking on the vfd uh, it stops that spindle really, really fast. So. One thing I would say that it was a real important point. So, um, it, you know, if you've a couple other folks that cut spheres, I think uh, I think John Richardson's cut spheres for a long time. Um, also, there's another guys in Utah that cut spheres. Um, was it John that got the entry? Who's one who lost part of their thumb? Or, uh, that's great. That was Craig. Craig. So Craig, so don't want to grab a rock. That's why you see that Jason's got that dowel. Yeah. You ain't going to stop that rock from moving. If it moves, it's going to move. Do not put your body part down there because your body part will be removed along. Yeah. You ways. keep your hands so away from the core bits. They're, they're, they're not forgiving if you get caught up in them. Um, now, I, I, the big, I wanted the big to thing up. is this, and, and this is what I tell everybody who's going to run a core bit you are going to break a bit. If you're core drilling, you're gonna knock teeth off of a bit sooner or later because the rocks misbehave. Sometimes there's a, a bug inside and something gets broken loose and it knocks a tooth off or the rock moves a little bit and you break a tooth off. If you prepare yourself mentally that yes, you're gonna knock some teeth off, then, you, then when it happens, all you're going to do is you're going to put the teeth back on. Like I've repaired, like when it breaks the segments, I have literally taken a segment that's broken into three pieces, put it back on the bit and soldered the segment back together and drilled with it until I use the segment up. You can do a huge amount with a torch and, you know, revitalize a bit. Um, the, the main shaft on this machine is so heavy. Um, everything's built to take a lot of abuse. So if you knock teeth off, it, you know, it's a temporary thing. You put your teeth back on and you keep drilling. Uh, let, me, let me pose a question for, for, uh, for really for Jason, but also I know John, you have a point of view on this because you designed the machine and we sell it. But Jason, like you are in oil and gas. So you're in court, you're in, in geology, I guess coal mining or whatever kind of geology works. So you guys know about core bits and core drills. Many people say, well, I can just get a Hilti little core drill thing and I can go do my own core drill. Now, you went and you invested in a core drill, core drill rig versus using the little hand core drill that you hear people talk about. Um, obviously, you spent more money than you Good could question. buy that. So it'd be great for people to understand what is the difference. The, the biggest difference is the hardness of rock. Um, I 
purposely got this drill because I plan on doing a lot of mukaite and a lot of Australian petrified wood. And you just can't do that with the other drill bits. Um, there's plenty of people that do, they do some fantastic spheres, but you're really limited to maybe six hardness mm -hmm. or softer. You're not getting up into the sevens, eights, um, nines at all. Uh, the other thing is that the drill bit itself you've constantly got to clean it. This one, this is pretty nice. It's, I don't have to do much on the cleaning. Uh, as long as I regulate between my rock hardnesses, it cleans itself. Yeah, yeah. John, any take on that? Because I know, I know you had tried all those other kinds of tools because yeah. we're like, shit, if we can do it yeah. cheap, let's do it. Yeah, well, it's very deliberate. You know, I, I spent probably seven years refining the formula for these segments mm -hmm. uh, because you know everybody will say you know like my favorite is is when they say 100 percent more diamond well in a core bit that's like death you have too many diamonds then what happens is the pressure on each diamond gets so low that you put it into a hard rock it isn't going to do anything but squeal it won't cut it at all um, it's having a softer matrix and uh, the right diamond concentration that makes the core bit work. Most manufacturers, uh, you know, whether it's MK or whether it's, you know, Hilti, Hilti or any of those kind of guys, Bosch, I mean, they're, they're making core bits for asphalt and concrete. That's like, drilling sandstone it's really abrasive so they want a really hard matrix and they cram them full of diamond because they're drilling really soft stuff it, it works great on that stuff you try and drill a, a piece of arizona petrified wood with that bit you're just gonna make a whole bunch of noise and heat the rock up and not have success yeah now coolant matters a whole lot too um, because you're running, you're running the coolant, and can you talk just briefly, and then we're we'll get to the next video, but about coolant, because Natter at Enter the Earth has core drills, and I think that's a real important part about core drilling. He was running mineral oil that he had sourced there, and it just wasn't drilling at all. Can you talk to that, John, a little bit? Oh, you want me to talk to it? I do. Um, well, yeah. So. Uh, when we set up his core drill setup, the problem we had, because he's in Madagascar, uh, is that getting oil there was very limited. So uh, we were we were drilling uh, rose quartz, which is not that hard, and we were having tremendous problems getting through the material, and we're generating a lot of heat. I noticed, and I did a bunch of experimentation and stuff. And, and I noticed the oil was like really thick. It was probably uh, like our oil is five to seven CST at 40 degrees. And the oil that we had gotten there was probably 25 or 30. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up doing is we ended up shipping a container of oil over to, to his factory because uh, when we changed the oil to the thinner oil, everything just worked great. And he's doing these, he's doing those amazing lamps. He's drilling fluorite. He's drilling uh, rose quartz to make a uh, cylinder shaped lamps. And so he does a lot of drilling and he uses the bigger core drills that yeah, we he's have. got. The, he's got a couple of the big, bit, and big drills and a couple of small drills. Uh, but the oil, is really important. If you run thick oil on core drill, you're going to have a tremendous amount of drag because part of what to think about is this. If you are in a slab saw, the amount of blade, you know, like, okay, if your blade is this, you know, round, you know, big round thing, the amount of blade that's engaged in the rock is what, maybe 20%, 30%. It's not half because you got your flanges up you're working above the flanges with a core bit. If you unroll that bit and look at your engagement that's in the rock, it's huge. And the drag of thick oil in there 
and that you're not flushing and that you're hydroplaning on the end of the segments all work against you. Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's awesome. So let's, let's move the to the other issue with uh, not using the right oil is misting. Uh, yeah. You don't want any misting in that drill. Uh, there's too much eye contact, not in terms of direct eye contact, but you, you got to be fully engaged with it when you're starting. And if it's misting, it's not going to be good. Right. Right. Well, one thing that you also said is you said that this generates a lot of sludge. Mathematically, the core drill is equivalent to uh, seven, eight saws running simultaneously for coring. So the equivalent of doing the 26 cuts is essentially you need eight saws running at the same time to do what that one core bit does in a single pass. Right. Well, if, if you if you think about what you do with cuts like when you cut the first cube on the old style 26 cuts each cut on it you know like if you're cutting a three inch cube each cut on an 18 is probably 10 to 12 minutes something like that and that you can do those four cuts plus the corner cuts in one shot uh is huge like I think if you had 10 saws in a shop versus one core drill, the core drill is still going to win. Yeah. Probably right. better than that. Yeah. Particularly if well, you, if you open it up and you're getting your one millimeter every 15 seconds. Yeah. I think, think that's a, that's a suggestion there, Jason. I, um, I did. The, the other five cores I got out of that went a lot faster. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're like, right, let me crank this puppy. Let's run the next one. I do see your hand, Win. Just hang there. We're going to run this next video, and then we'll come to uh, Scott Wynn's uh, question here. Let me go here. And this is the first cross cut. We have our fluorite. We've already done the first core on it. We're coming in for this first cross cut. Uh, so on this piece, the thing I'm looking for most is trying to maximize the contrast. There's some really nice structure in the green, but I'd like to maximize as much as the purple, uh, try and avoid the white, uh, even though it'll be on the base, well, maybe on the side, I'm not sure how to look. The other thing I want to miss is this bit here. Um, it's a little cloudy, crazed. I'm not sure how deep some of these uh, go so we'll try and miss that so we'll place it in here and see what we do I'm going to play with the advantage of the core bit and try and get up here we have a little bit of a divot so if I come in about place the teeth on this line I think I'll be right trial and error though Just a little bit of white. That's not too bad. Purple huh, just about came off. Not as much purple in there as I thought, but by the time we take these wings off, that's okay. Still a nice stone. 
So let's go in for the second cross cut. Pause the video here, Sherm. All right. Uh, pause, pause. All right. Okay. So one of the things that Jason's not utilizing that is a really handy feature that's built into our fixture is over there behind the bit, you'll see there's a, a, a bracket. And basically what we do is we have a threaded rod with a lever on it. Now, what you would do to set this is you would have your core in the bit and you'd set up where you're where you come over with that pin and adjust the pin so you're right against the edge of the core and when you lock that into the left hand notch point at the left hand notch there sherman now that's the right hand that notch mm -hmm. so when that's the right hand notch that you just marked and the left hand notch is right below it so you want your pin touching the edge of the core in your left hand notch now what this does for you is that when you start the third and the fourth and if you drill a fifth that you can get it right up against that pin start your drill get your set and then you lift that lever up and back it off and back then right what that does is it it keeps you from having an offset because the offset's going to be a flat spot or a, a like a little groove on the size your inside of your ball you can eyeball it pretty well but it's better if you use that pin, particularly if you're doing like you're going to do 20 or 30 two and a half inch balls. You set them all up, you go, and then every single one is drilled exactly the same. Go ahead and you can continue, Sherm. All right. that again Sherm can you yeah. can, can you go back to that because uh there's some there's actually some stuff that needs to be talked about here okay uh, all right uh, yeah we're, we're looking at that fixture towards the end hold on a second right uh there. back up. right there, right there right there right there is that okay it's a little blurry uh that's okay so so basically um tony is asking the question about what it keeps you from drilling into the to the fixture well if you walk away from the machine nothing you're gonna well, you walk away from the machine that drill is going to go all the way through the table it will go all the way through it will go through everything so you don't walk away when you're doing this kind of stuff um you can have like you can do other stuff in your shop if you're doing a, a long drill on you know uh, a hard rock uh, but it's fast. It's really fast. Um, I would say this. Now, what Jason did drilling this third drill is not what I would recommend. And here's why. 
that on fluoride, it's going to be forgiving. So it, is, it isn't going to care. It's going to sit there and behave. But if you drill, let's say, a piece of Bruno Jasper, and you saw, like, see those little pieces down there that fell off, the little corner pieces? Right down here. Yeah, purple, yeah. My method is this, is that when I'm drilling the, any of the cross drills, I watch, and as soon as those pieces start to fall off, I'm stopping the drill. Now, the reason why is if you're drilling something like a Bruno Jasper, which I love to drill little balls of Bruno Jasper, and you let it go beyond that, then there, there's a little tip uh, that's where the rock broke off. And if it drops into a slot between the teeth, it's going to grab that rock and it's going to try and spin it in your jig. And if it's a Bruno Jasper, it's going to freaking explode. And you're going to have Bruno Jasper cabs then. So um, I don't, you won't see me run past the end of the cut on those. I'll stop. And if I leave myself, you know, an eighth of an inch before I drop off, then that's, then that's wh where I want to be. Um, yeah, because I've watched you sometimes. You have a one that's off that you just go pink take it off and then yeah. you're into your next piece. Because the risk is you spin in the jig. Now, the other thing I wanted to notice, I, I noticed when you set your, your core in that jig, you got a little bit of rock front to back. Um, what I do with my jigs, because jigs will loosen up a little over time. I just take the jig and I go over to my vise and I turn the jig upside down and I put the vise across the saddle and I squeeze the saddle. So you squeeze bit. this side and that side together. Yep. And then I check my core in it so it's tight because I like to be able to push the core in it and it's actually snug and can't move at all because then I don't have any risk of that core rocking a little bit. Um, and, and that just makes it a little bit more secure in drilling. Uh, that's the nice thing about the jigs is that you can adjust them. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention here is you'll see on this jig, and you might try and get to where it's a little bit more clear, Sherm. Let me see. There we go. Um, you can see on the jig, we actually drilled down into the jig. So when you first get a core drill, the first thing you have to do is you have to drill your first cross drill and you're going to drill the cross drill and the jig at the same time because we don't machine that slot in there it's ridiculous to machine a slot in there so you know i i like to do something like a jasper or an agate and and then i lay the core in there i line up the jig uh see these tabs here the mounting this, tabs this? on the jig sherman the mounting tab go down mounting tab uh, oh here yes yes yeah, those are adjustable. So when you first put your jig in, you're gonna adjust it front to back so the bit is uh, matched up the same on the front and the back of this cradle. <coughs> and then you are set your feed really slow and you're gonna drill through the rock and the jig on your first time. Now Diamond doesn't like to drill steel, but it, it, our, our, ours will drill it just fine. Um, and then once you have that first drill in there and your jig is all set, the beauty to it is when you drop that jig in each time, it's perfectly aligned and repeatable. So you don't have so to- So it's aligned, these here align the positioning so you're directly under your core bit every single time. Yeah. So um, let's, let's do this. I know we got some questions. We're a little bit over time, but should we go to the, 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 the next let's... video because we're close? Um, what, we got one more video? We do. This is the Jason, last two Jason's drills. Jason's awesome, man. He produced so much content. Yeah. Yeah, I decided to do the last two cuts on this. I probably could have put it on the uh, diamond wheel, but I think we'll be okay on this. It's a little soft, but I think it'll drill through. We're about on the end.
And this is where that pin would really help Jason line it up like a boom exactly, mechanical. Exactly. I bet you Jason's gonna be digging those pins out like shit. Let's speed it up. This should have a little tighter. Looks good. Splash guard back up. There we go. Last cut. Form. Yeah, that one hadn't quite finished cutting through. Yeah. Touch that up on the grinding wheel. Looks pretty good. Super cool, Jason. Like, that's like, I mean, for people, like, when you think, now obviously we had a lot of, you know, talk as we went through this, but if you actually condense down doing the, the, the whole core process, radically faster um uh, let's bring you up scott can you bring scott up he's got a question and, and scott's waiting on a core drill himself <laughs> yes you got the space in your yeah, shop you already space for, in it. Your shop for it yeah and i'm working on uh electrical the uh i had an electrician in and he's going well how much amps does this take what size you know any information i'm going i have no idea <laughs> so i was curious about uh, what's he kind of mentioned different size wire for 220 and uh, you know and a size certain size breaker or not yeah, John I do you can, know I anything can get that for you okay that I appreciate actually, that I'll get that information and you can put, put it up on the website sure yeah we'll add it to the description, yeah, we'll to the description. okay I'll be looking for it because I, I want that in there so when that core drill does arrive I want to get on it um, yep out of curiosity, the jig, it sits on a, a piece of plywood, I assume. Yeah. Does that yep. come with or do I need to prepare uh, it comes, it comes with it. some plywood? It comes with it. It comes okay. With it. It's all pre-drilled. And, then, it my, pre and then my last question is, uh, hey, Jason, I don't know if you remember me. Yep. Uh, we came up last, my wife and I came up in the last September and you sold us on a cord drill. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in actual fact, uh, uh, actual fact, in one of the uh, early videos, the forest floor that you left was you left here. Left that's that cool. Left here, that's that cool. I, I didn't hear you, Jason. Sorry. It's echoing a little bit. It's so little in bit. one of the early videos. It may be echo from you. From you. Are you got two things open, Scott? Two things open, Scott. Yeah, I've. I'm broadcasting the TV so my wife can see. Hang, hang on, let me be hearing. So I, you know, have to cut my audio off here. Okay. All right. So when Go I was going through the uh, first video with the fluorite, uh, your piece that you dropped off for me was in there. Um, I finally got to drilling it. It oh, had been cool. preformed already. Uh, with the eight sides and we were concerned about how that was going to hold in the jig right just right. using the dowel and easing the pressure in as soon as the teeth were in i didn't touch it it just 
went through like butter, didn't even spin around. So that's it's fantastic. Really good. Yeah, because what I left, Jason, was a cube of Rocky Butte Jasper because we got cubes just stacked in bookshelves like, you know, a library. So that's good to know. That's that's perfect. That's good to hear, Jason. Appreciate that very much. Come that's on over solid. before you get yours. What? Come on over and play with it before you get yours. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> careful <laughs> I got you guys live pretty like close that. to each other yeah i know I, mean, I know exactly where he lives hey jason's <laughs> in salt lake city i mean you know we got a bunch of people in salt lake city yeah i, I just live south in highland of all names yeah. so yeah. thank you i'll be looking for that electrical information john okay yep yep so can you guys put up some of the spheres that jason's been doing I know we got some pictures he sent in. I know we lost Joanna, her power's out. So uh, there we go. There's cross cutting, there we go. Go to the next one. That's a nice, that's a nice wood sphere there. Yeah, Arizona. Blue lace. I found some really dark blue lace, by the way, John, that got shipped back from the Philippine factories. Freaking blue is blue. Good. It's nice. Ah, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, what we're planning to do is we will do uh, more sphere cutting. Um, we have yet to schedule when we're going to do that because Jason's out on like projects um, which yeah, is so one we'll do a part to, to, we'll do a part two of this, but it may be a couple of weeks before we get that together. Right, right, uh, right. So so we're we're kind of out of time. One of the things I wanted to say, Jason, awesome job. Really appreciate you taking the time to make all the videos and bring this content to everybody here so they can be learning from your experience and, and your learning. Um, and I really appreciate the you taking the time for that. Can no, we just I answer a few it. questions here, John? We just have okay. a few ones. We got a few questions that we could blow through. Well, real let's, quick. let's do the questions real quick. We're on yeah. topic right now. Um, uh, John's iPad was asking, well, we're going to have more Corbett's in. I think you're sending me more Corbett's I now, am, right? I'm building Corbett's right now. So um, we're probably two months away uh, from, from getting them in, just the transit time. time. Yeah. Uh, water? No, don't run water. That would be a uh, hold on a second. Now, I, I'll tell you this. I, I ran water in my core drill. This is before I figured out the, the like to solve the mystery of oil. So I, I didn't want to run like, you know, I've been running Pella at that time or Almeg and that stuff all smells horrible and it's a huge mess. And if you're doing Arizona wood and you're trying to glue it, you know, to stabilize it, if it's fractured, it just makes it way harder. Right. So I ran my drill for a long time on water. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you are drilling a soft, you know, chrysocolla or porous materials, you certainly can run water. You're not going to hurt anything on this. this. The main shaft, the stainless steel, everything, the way, the way it's built, I, you can run either. The big thing you're going to notice is your bit life goes way down with water and you're going to have to keep your bits sharp because the water won't keep them sharp like you know running oil so you got the flexibility to do that it's not always desirable yeah um Tody, you were asking what keeps the core drill from grinding into the material retaining i think we covered that with your setting zero so there's two times you're setting zero when he's drilling just the first cut he's setting zero to the wood then when he goes to the cross drill he's sitting zero resetting that indicator so he knows what zero is in the jig since the jig is higher so you can just set it on that thing it's really cool just push the button it defines zero and then you know exactly where you're at in the rock um uh sell the jig separate no we're currently not selling the jig separate we we talked about it uh it's 
like it's it's kind of pain in the ass to do frankly just to do the, yeah, the one jigs piece. the jigs are kind of a pain in the ass to make and uh right it's now it's not that they're hard but they're matched with the core bit so that's part of the thing is that when we are making the bits we're buying core bit tube that we're then splitting that's part of the jig so you've got a match set when we've we've actually looked at doing just jig separate but now we're ba you're back into the issue of how do i match things because core bits here in the states tend to be well it depends if it's old or new whether it's metric or standard and there's all yeah, kinds of yeah. different ranges um so we haven't really looked at doing that um uh richard um uh, says after the cut, when you turn the machine back on, are you cleaning the bit? I, I think you just flinging the oil off there, right? You every time you turn it on, I'm like, this dude, yeah. I never do that when I've drilled. I just spin the excess oil off. It's just a habit, probably doesn't need to be done at all. It, well, it doesn't drip all over your hands, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That oil's expensive by the time it gets to Utah. I gotta save every drop. <laughs> it's free shipping to Utah. Come on. It's free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. Um, Bart, uh, what do you do with the scrap? Um, that's a good question. What are you doing with uh the the scrap? Uh the little wings, I'm usually just throwing, but mm -hmm. anything bigger than about uh half inch, I put into a viber lap and just make rocks to give to neighbors give away to kids try and get people interested yeah well i'm uh, speaking about bart so bart who's asking this question is going to be doing an amazing webinar with us on di i never can say the right word the glass dichronic glass am i saying that right nope do you say it john dichroic dichro and doing composites so laminates between uh gemstones and glass he does amazing amazing work and we're actually working on the webinar and that's going to be coming up imminently so you're going to be you're going to be yeah, hearing i saw bart that. stuff and i'm like man we got to get this guy working with us he is everybody, amazing everybody want to see what he's doing yeah amazing amazing so you guys are going to definitely love that um scott so yes we do do six inch bits we don't have it on the website um in the moment partly because i haven't got them in to put them i only put stuff up on the web when i actually get at least it in although they all sell out super super fast um but yes six inch bits and for you with your core drill coming in you could probably turn a six inch bit but you're like john said earlier you're going to need to go easy with it you yeah, know you can't take jam it the feet up full on there because you're going to be at the top limit of of what that that motor can turn yep yep and dan's got a question there i had a good talk with dan the other day um we'll pull up dan here briefly let's keep it short though dan because we got to roll because dan can get on a roll in his stuff i'm un un unmute yourself i'm going to uh, unmute you okay somebody unmuted me there we go i unmuted you dan Oh, thank you. Uh, I was just going to comment that uh, if you want to see some absolutely incredible work with dichroic glass, check out Jack Storm out of Los Angeles. Yeah, B Bart knows Jack. I oh, think, really? I think, I think that was a little bit of an uh, inspiration from Bart. Yeah, Jack is awesome. He's also a customer of ours as well. Yeah, I'd love to talk to Jack, uh, maybe through Bart. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, guys, let's uh, let's wrap it up for this evening. We'll 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 send you a uh, uh, a link to the next webinar that's getting queued up. Definitely, we appreciate you being here. Two requests that I have: um, one, give us a good Google review. If you like this, go up on our Google thing. Can the guys put it in the chat? and click a link and say, hey, these guys are great. Here's a five star. We're like, you know, we bust our ass really trying to give you guys value. This is a way that you can really give back to us and help us is give us good reviews. Um, the other thing is now that we've got our YouTube channel back, subscribe to the YouTube channel, get subscribed. That actually makes the lapidary information more visible for people because our mission is to inspire and engage people in the lapidary arts, whether they're buying things, whether they want to make things, whether they're your customers, you're learning about lapidary. And many of you are makers and we want to help you grow your ability to do beautiful work and have other people know about it. And that gets back to what Lizelle said is like, 
If you're doing cool stuff, send it to us. Let us promote you on a social channels. Our real mission is to get people engaged. We know if we help people become inspired, we educate them, they'll buy some stuff from us, but they're also going to buy stuff from other people as well. So, you know, the saying is when the tide comes in, all the boats rise. And that's really our mission, not only here, but also, you know, we're focused on growing in uh, introducing lapidary into different parts of the world as well. So uh, we really appreciate your participation here. Anything else you want to wrap up with, John? No, that's great. Jason, you are a rock star, dude. Like, super great job on that. Really appreciate that. And he, Jason sent us, like, we got another two hours of video for Jason of yeah. other stuff. So he, he nah, over-delivered. It was, it was fun. Great. I appreciate it. And thanks for the points, John. I'll go and turn the drill back on right now. Yeah, and actually, yeah. part of what we're going to take out of this is a lot of this we're going to actually take into writing an owner's manual because we'll first do this. This will be somewhat a video guide. Um, Because, you know, Scott, you're learning stuff. I know James Carpenter's on here, which is, by the way, a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, cabber and amazing artist. Um, He also has a core drill as well. So uh, anyway, folks, great to see you all. And we look forward to talking to you next week. See you guys. Thanks.